All right, so it looks like we are live online and also live here in person with our audience here at the Siena Art Institute. And we also have some other viewers joining us both on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page for today's live broadcast. So thank you to everyone for joining us both online and in person here. Um, we are really pleased to have as our speaker for tonight's talk, Nina Papa Constinotu. No, Nina Papa Constinotu. <laughs> I apologize for my pronunciation. Uh, so she is our um, special guest, not only for this evening, but also uh, for this four week residency that we're just kicking off this week. Uh, so we are really pleased to have her. Thanks also to the sponsorship from the Stavros Niarcos Foundation, who is co-sponsoring her residency here at the Siena Art Institute. So this conversation this evening is a way to get to know more about Nina and her, and her background as she begins her residency with us for these next four weeks at the Siena Art Institute. So I'll just mention both to our viewers online and also our viewers here in the audience that we very much welcome your questions. Uh, we'll be responding to questions during the second part of today's talk. Um, just to give you a little bit of um, information about Nina's background, uh, she is from Athens and her work mainly is an investigation of the relationship between text and its image. She has studied Greek literature in Athens and also visual arts with a concentration in drawing at Camberwell College of Arts in London. In 2015, she was artist in residence at the Seeker Center for Hellenic Studies at Princeton University. She has presented her work in several group and personal exhibitions in Greece and abroad, including recently at the Pierogi Gallery in New York, the Mosin Gallery in Tehran, the Athens Concert Hall, the National Art Museum of China in Beijing, the Foundation Hippocrene in Paris, Antidron Documenta 14 in Kassel, the Central Exhibition Hall in St. Petersburg, Russia, the EMST National Museum of Contemporary Art in Athens, the Martin Abukaya Gallery in Paris, the Drawing Center in New York, the Ather Gallery in Zeda, Saudi Arabia, the Fondazione Pulisi Consentino in Catania, Italy, and the first Arezzo Biennale, also here in Italy, and many more as well. So again, as Nina begins her presentation, I'll just again remind you uh, both here in person and online that we welcome your questions during the second part of Nina's talk today. So for now, I'll turn the microphone over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks for the introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, as Lisa said, um, my work is indeed an investigation uh, on the relationship between text and its image, text and texture. But this is, and, and the work that I'm going to be showing to you today uh, is a selection of text-based works. I studied drawing and I was interested, when I studied drawing, I was first interested in illustrating um, text. Uh, so I was also interested in the relationship between marks and drawing. Uh, so yes, uh, I investigate uh, text and its image and uh, in order for the text uh, to, to become an image, uh, um, I try to eliminate all information that would serve the very purpose of communicating meaning. So the, uh, the text undergoes different sorts of transformation, digital or manual, or both, in order to become illegible. And then I trace or hand copy a blurred image or a dense, or a dense um, uh, texture of it. Um, my approach to text is inspired or even defined by my studies in ancient Greek literature, as uh, Elisa said before. Um, on one hand, and of course, uh, my love uh, for reading on the other. Um, more specifically, I believe that um, my approach was defined by a lecture we had at the university when I was studying ancient Greek uh, on the critical apparatus and the verses of the ancient Greek poet Archilochos. Um, that was a very long time ago, before I even dreamed of becoming an artist. Uh, so, like an, asp an aspiring young scholar back then, I started imagining how wonderful it would be if I could fill in the missing pieces, make sense of the empty spaces between letters, solve the mystery of the missing text, and restore it to its wholeness. Inevitably, my approach is inspired also by the tools and methods of a scholar, a researcher, or a scribe. So what I do in my work is I copy, 
I magnify text and words, and I trace. Uh, in one of my early series of works, which, with which I will start here, uh, between the lines, I used two layers of text printed on transparent paper. And by blowing up this, between the lines one, I made, I think, four or five. By blowing up certain tiny parts between letters, I came up with these images, which I then photocopied uh, in large scale and traced with pencil on transparent paper, dot by dot. Let me show you another one. Here I aimed for the work to reflect visually a literal approach to the concept of reading between the lines. So it is as if by enlarging the text, one could immerse oneself into it and discover some hidden meaning that couldn't see or perceive otherwise. My hand reproduces the image, not as a photocopy machine, but in a reversed time-consuming procedure, which is, again, is interesting for me, in an attempt to record and understand by means of memory and by experience. Uh, this is Bookcase. Bookcase is an ongoing project um, which reflects an attempt to respond to the question, how can an entire book produce an image? Here I have hand copied word for word books onto a single sheet of carbon paper placed on a single sheet of paper. I have copied each book from the beginning to the end in overlapping layers. And the titles of the works that I will be showing you in a minute um, hint at what the, work, uh, the works are about. So each of these drawings that you see in blue, lighter or darker blue, um, are, uh, it, it are the, it the outcome of, um, uh, of the imprint, of carbon copy imprint on paper. So this is St. John the Apocalypse, uh, which I made in 2004. I still make this type of works. It's an ongoing project. So I first used the text of St. John the Apocalypse because I was compelled by the imagery of it and I wanted to explore how this very text can provide its illustration. I went on to use more books in my bookcase to see how different books could provide different images. For instance, this Federico Garcia Lorca, Blood Wedding, 2011, a few years after the first one. Tristan Torbier, Yellow Loves, Kabafi, erotic poems or love poems. The works are also about the layering of knowledge because it, it they are hand copied in layers and layers of text. the text anymore like you couldn't read it you couldn't read it there was no uh, sorry, sorry Nina sorry to interrupt there just um seems to be a disconnect with the um, with the online stream oh. it's coming I know the projector seems to be coming in fine but I wonder if um perhaps if we wanted to just um disconnect and connect again perhaps that would help the the stream okay. to come back in it's strange because it seems like your computer is functioning fine on its own. Um, so we're going to go ahead and stop here? Sure, yes. We'll just, um, so if our online audience can just hold tight for one moment, we'll be right back. So sorry for the delay.
sorry about that. We should. All right. So we should be back. Okay. Maybe start from the beginning, showing the blue. By the way, do, maybe you know younger generations don't know the, the carbon copy. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized that <laughs> it was my generation. Um, so you know, um, I was talking about. Uh, copying and uh, the labor-intensive work, and I remembered when I you know, had the scribes in mind that for my generation, the way to produce uh, copies, hand uh, handmade copies of uh, of text or, or of images of uh, many things was to place uh, carbon copy copy paper. And uh, if you wanted to create more copies, then what you did is you yeah uh, you um, changed. The pages underneath, so you had more pages every time. Uh, so the mistake I I imagined for 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 an imaginary scribe was that he forgot to change the pages underneath. So everything, every every single uh, word he wrote was fell on the on a single surface. So he created a book, all right. He copied the book, but you couldn't read anything because it was all um, uh, two dimensional. It was all uh, on a single. Um, sheet of paper. So moving on to this is yeah, Kavasti. Now you can see, you know, what, what the books I, I like. So it is like a portrait of me in a way, because if the a bookcase, our bookcase at home reflects our personalities, sort of a self portrait. I guess. This is white on white, as you can see, or you can't see because it is white on white. So here I uh, experimented with white carbon paper. This is Franz Kafka, Letter to Father. I chose to transcribe uh, uh, Kafka's homonymous work on white carbon paper as the work is a confession Kafka addressed to his father, which ironically never reached its recipient. He gave it to his mother, who never passed it on to his father. Therefore, what is left of his writing is a muddled image of white on white, perhaps an image of mixed feelings and intentions or an image of silence. This is Dante Paradiso. You can guess now that I copied uh, Dante's uh, Paradise. And this is Dante's uh, Dante Inferno, Hell. Uh, here I experimented, it, it is the same uh, approach as in the bookcase series. It's the same, I follow the same principle of transcription of entire books on layers. Uh, I experimented with a large scale, so the, wor the works are each the size of a door to allude to the concept of a gate or a passage. For obvious reason, uh, obvious reasons, hell as a passage, um, paradise, etc. And this is a, a, a detail of it. Moving on to something in color, although not much of a color. So the only colors I use I use are the colors of the of a pen I we used to have. Now you have purple, you have all colors of pen. But we used to have blue, uh, black, red, and uh, green, and that was it. So I stick to these four colors because <laughs> it helps me a lot not to make choices of colors. <laughs> so this is uh, Antigone uh, 1. Uh, both this work and Antigone 2 were made with archival markers on transparent paper. Uh, there are two version, versions based on Sophocles' Antigone, the, the tragedy, where uh, uh, I have transcribed random dialogues from the play in a different color for each character to form either a fringe, as in here, or a, de a decorative motif. And um, obviously I was looking for relations between text and um, embroidery, text and texture. Moving on to black and white again. This is uh, this is part what we see is part of the 19 drawings. The it is an entire work um, uh, made of uh, 19 drawings. It is called Forget Me Not. Uh, 
And the source material uh, of, this, uh, of this work is the correspondence of the romantic, po romantic poet Heinrich Kleist and Henrietta Vogel to their family and friends before they committed suicide together in Potsdam near Berlin. This is a detail of, oh, not the first one, but maybe of these two. What I did here is I hand copied and then scanned and manipulated the letters uh, on Photoshop in such a way so as to make them illegible, as if their marks dissolve into the background. And then I traced the printouts on transparent paper. So it is both um, the, the procedure of destroying something and then trying to bring it back together. So um, breaking, say, the text and then trying to, to trace it very, very carefully. It is this irony of trying to get back what is um, destroyed. Um, so yes, you can make out from, from afar that there's maybe there's something written there, but even if you go closer, you can't see anything. <laughs> Moving on to another, say, technique. It's, uh, this is Anna, this is Henry, is it? Yes, this is Henry. So Anna and Henry is a, uh, it's not a diptych, they're separate works, but they are, they, they are about maybe, as you can guess, this is, I, I, will, I will start with Anais. These are four, uh, four letters of Anais name uh, to Henry Miller, and maybe you have guessed it from the title. Uh, uh, I hand copied the text, I cut it up in small pieces and then pasted them back together in a random way. Uh, and in Henry, I used five letters of Henry Miller to Anais' name and, um, uh, and use the same process. Here you can see a detail, maybe. So what inspired me here is um, I was fascinated by, um, by the phrase Homer uses to, um, to describe how words fly. He uses the phrase epe apteroida, uh, which is, you know, he spoke, for instance, he spoke to her with words that fly. It's like the Latin uh, verba volant. Uh, so I had in mind, you know, words that, uh, the words that fly, and at the same time, this, um, the, the amazing uh, shapes, the forms that uh, birds take when they migrate in the sky. So they, they gather and they make all this um, um, very, very, uh, this, this marks that from afar, they seem like marks to me, you know, the, the gray shapes and lighter shapes, uh, lighter shapes. Um, so moving on to something different again. Uh, this is the title of this work is Orestes and Iphigenia. Uh, instead of using a pen, here I transcribed or copied text, maybe transcribed is a better word, using a pen because I thought what else could be used instead of a pen or a pencil. And the pen is um, also creates um, it, 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 the, the, the way of using paper here is like embroidery. So I use both sides of the paper. So I was interested in that uh, concept as well. So there are several drawings in this, uh, uh, works in this series of, uh, of drawings with punctures on paper. This is Oestes and Iphigenia. Uh, there's also King Lear, Cordelia, Family Reunion, and this is a, a, a detail of family reunion. Uh, as I said, I used a pin instead of a pencil. Uh, these are mostly, this is a work of words are inspired or based on uh, uh, theatrical plays mostly. So, so the piercing gives this relief effect to the drawings and forms a motif similar to embroidery. Uh, in Orestes and Iphigenia, I have used a dialogue between uh, the, two, the, the siblings uh, the dialogue they have uh, before they recognize each other. So in the middle, they they meet. They actually recognize each other. So this is the part that is in the set at the center of this uh, drawing. This is yeah, King Lear. Is the fringe, 
And in uh, family reunion, I have used an expert of T.S. Eliot's T.S. Eliot's homonymous play. This, this is the install well, the installation view of Sylvia Plath, the missing journal. As the title hints, the text is by Sylvia Plath, so it is, and it is from uh, one of her journals, but not the missing one, of course, because I used it. Um, so what I had in mind then was the, uh, the rumor, or maybe it was an actual fact, that Ted Hughes, her husband, had destroyed or hidden uh, one of her journals. And that inspired me in, 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 in a way, because I thought that maybe, you know, if something is missing as a text, but maybe underneath there is still the trace of the writing without the ink. So I hand, hand copied uh, excerpts of, uh, from her uh, journal, but with a, with a pen without ink. And um, on both sides of this paper, so that it wouldn't be easy to read, it wouldn't be illegible ultimately, but it would uh, bear the traces of, um, of the writing. And then I sewed the pages together as if they were found separately, and I was trying to put them back together again by sewing them together in, a, in the way that the book is bound. And this is a, a detail. And this is Diary of a Young Girl. As you can see, this is <laughs> I'm very interested in epistolography and the uh, diaries and journals. And if, I don't know if you've noticed, I like literature a lot. So, you know, my, my source material comes from literature a lot and from um, uh, writers. So, Diary of a Young Girl. Here I have transcribed the first 28 diary entries by Anna Frank from the day that she received her diary to the day that her uh, family took refuge in a hiding place in the Netherlands. I have chosen to put emphasis uh, on those first days as, uh, uh, those, as a testimony of a, of a teenage girl with her youthful passions, thoughts and conflicts peculiar to her age, as these are documented during a journal uh, cycle of 28 days. Let me see if I have another image of this. No. I have copied the diary and this on, on very thin paper, so the actual marks that you see here, and this is the work, uh, the final work, are the imprints of ink left on the paper underneath the actual paper where I wrote. It is as if someone has removed the diary pages, but the marks on the pages underneath still bear evidence of the writing, still bear some ink. 24 hours. This, is, this work is made with correction pen, uh, or felt tip, I think it's called, uh, on paper, the, the white um, uh, thing, the, the white ink we use to erase and correct. In uh, 24 hours, um, I have used the testimony of a woman political prisoner in exile on the island of Macronesus. More specifically, I have copied her account of the 24 hours she spent on the island during which she was forced to reform or correct her political beliefs. I have used correction pen to copy her writing, a medium which is normally used in order to erase and correct. And this is the cover of the, of the journal, say. So you can see that it's white on white. And moving on to the next one, this is letter HP. Uh, it is again from a letter of a political, uh, Greek political prisoner in, in the Corfu prison, a letter to his daughter. I have transcribed the letters in pencil, erased them. Uh, the letters, I mean, you know, the letter, it is one letter, it is a two-page letter. So I have transcribed the text in pencil, I have erased it, and then enlarged and traced in ink what was left of the writing. You can see maybe the smudges of the, of the eraser as well. And I was very interested in those smudges as well, because it is the evidence that some, something, you know, there was an attempt to erase something on one hand and the effort to restore it on the other. 
So the first work that is not on paper, it is an in situ work, uh, in the light of this festive day is the title. It is, it is made with whitewash paint on wall and it is a site specific installation. Uh, for this work, uh, I, this work was uh, I made on the island of Andros in Greece. I used the verse of the Greek surrealist poet Andres Empirikos and copied his handwriting on an, on an old wall where the plaster had peeled off, revealing the stonework underneath it. The writing is not always clear because the surface is uneven, thus creating a textured canvas, which makes text almost illegible. So in, in this case, what made text illegible was the my canvas. Uh, say, which was the wall. And the fact that uh, whitewash paint uh, fades with the sun and with rain and uh, with um, as time uh, passes. Oh, I was also interested here in the interplay between the uh, strong sunlight and the shadows uh, of the cypress trees on the wall, which confused the writing further. Uh, the work is still there. I don't know whether it is uh, legible or not, but it would be interesting to see also because it is part of the process, you know, the, the, um, the decay of all the, um, the fading out of the, of the paint. This is another view of it. Pericles Funeral Oration, um, 2016. Uh, this work comprises 16 drawings. I have used each, maybe you don't know the ancient text, of course. It is, um, uh, it is considered to be maybe one of the oldest or the first text about democracy. It is uh, um, Pericles, the ancient Greek uh, leader, uh, very, very important. Uh, speech he gave uh, in after the first Peloponnesian War in um, in a, ancient times. So what I did here, I cut the the, the ancient text. I uh, printed the the text. I I cut it into strips so as to deconstruct it, and then I pasted the strips of paper back together in a random way so as to make the text illegible. So even if you cannot read ancient Greek, this, does, this would make sense, even if you could read uh, ancient Greek. But you can see, you know, how the, the strips of paper are pasted together in a random way. And so the, the very choice of text, of course, and it's, it's not uh, random, it's the, the construction and reconstruction refers to the ways in which we perceive and define our identity and historical past and the relationship between uh, its essence and its image. Uh, along the same lines is We the People, which draws on the American Constitution. So here I have manipulated the text in the same way as above to form four, four grids, as many as the pages of the old text. Um, again, my aim is to question our perception of history in relation to current times, the ways in which we use the form rather than the essence or the spirit of such emblematic texts of political and social significance. It's funny because may I go back a little bit? Because if you if you see the title of the of We the People of the American Constitution, it it it, it looks more like Arabic uh, rather than uh, uh, English. Well, to me anyway. <laughs> uh, moving on to another series of works. Stacks of books, as uh, the title hints at, uh, uh, the, the, the series of works has to do with the idea of books in stacks. All, although here I haven't used the actual text of the books, but uh, instead I inscribe overlapping layers of colophons of books. So the colophon of a book is uh, all the information a book has as an object, so where it is printed, uh, what font, what type of paper was used, and uh, until recently, I don't know if it is uh, still the, the case in uh, in books in uh, in Europe, but we still have it in. Um, uh, it is all the information about the book uh, as an object, and uh, so here I have used colophon because you can see that there's some illustration as well. 
I've had used colophons um, of European books from the uh, 14th century until today, in overlapping layers, one on top of the other, not too many, so that you know they are visible somehow. Um, moving on to uh, this series of works, which are some of them are diptychs, some of them are not. Um, this is Adieu. It's um, the text by the text. Uh, this is Adieu, and this is maybe the same one. Yes, part two. And this is the Sovereign Son by Aeneas. So these these are obviously diptychs. So this this type of um, this series of works are made, the first part, by tracing on red carbon copy paper the printed marks word for word. Here, for instance. And the second part of the diptych is uh, tracing between the words and under the lines. So I trace, as you can see here, a line that goes up and then goes down again because I trace under the, the lines and between the, and between the words. Um, so, yes, I trace all left pages on the left and all right pages on the right in overlapping layers. Uh, my interest in this case has to do with the different readings a book may have, a word-for-word -word reading and a reading between the lines. And I tried to render that in a, in a very literal way. Here you, you can make out a few words from the title. These are not finished works, but they are uh, drawings of the lacunae uh, on the papyri. So the, 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 research I, the research I made on the papyri in uh, Princeton uh, but, you know, the, the, rather during um, of, within the process of, um, of this residence in Princeton, I was very much interested in the lacunae, obviously, because they are the parts that are missing from the papyri. So I put the emphasis and um, traced uh, the lacunae. The lacunae means the missing parts, whether there are scratches, missing text, or whatever. To me, uh, visually, were very much like um, text in an unknown language. So I was very much interested in that. Um, maybe a code that is not deciphered yet. And I'm showing you this, even though it's not a finished work, it, 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 there were a few, only a few drawings, because that led me to the work I would, I would like to talk about now. Uh, not this one. <laughs> We're getting there. This is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So uh, from the lacuna in the papyri, so the missing part, uh, I was inspired to move on to um, creating, say, a language or a script or an alphabet, or I don't know if it's an alphabet, that comes from the part, uh, from the spaces between the words. Uh, so it, it is a follow-up to this research. Uh, here I have used the text uh, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was proclaimed by the United uh, Nations General Assembly in Paris in 1948. I have marked in black marker pen the spaces between the words of the declaration to shift the emphasis to all that is not written or is not there or on everything that is not put to practice. Uh, the black marks on canvas create a different kind of writing, undeciphered and illegible, a new text or an illustration of the absence, which brings to mind visually and is directly inspired by my research on the lacunas I explained before. Again, uh, the same uh, along the same lines is a morning diary based on Roland Barthes' uh, work. Uh, I have used Roland Barthes' uh, work to trace in black archival ink on tracing paper the empty spaces between the words on every page of the book. Barthes started his uh, uh, journal when his mother died and he kept writing for about two years. So ultimately, 
I don't know if it is evident. Well, it is on tracing paper, obviously, because I wanted to trace the spaces between the words. So ultimately, uh, it is morning there is about what is not said or cannot be said. It is about the absence of words or the impossibility to articulate one's feelings, especially when um, grieving, I guess. Which brings me to this online uh, project, online ongoing project, sorry, um, which I have started, uh, started a couple of, not five years ago. Uh, it doesn't have a name yet. It is, a, it is like a walking diary. So wherever I go, wherever I go, I walk around Athens and sometimes I see some uh, random marks, scratches, decay on walls, you know, it has to do with the city. To me, which are not text or even uh, destroyed text, are just scratches and random uh, marks. But to me, they resemble uh, textual messages like this one. And I will show you a bit more. This is on a wall, this is on, a, on an island in Greece. For instance, you can see that well, to me, you know, this part of a word that I, I, ca I cannot decipher yet. Uh, so wherever I walk, if I look well enough, it is very possible that I discover these hidden messages in an unknown and deciphered language. There are, they are images that look like text, but they are not parts of a text that has faded out. And this is me trying to, to do a frottage, I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, technique, you, uh, on a wall <laughs> that's crumbling uh, in an after in Greece. And this is the same, um, I would like to follow up on this uh, concept in Siena, as I have done in the parts of Athens and Princeton and Anafi and uh, it's, it is where uh, everywhere I go. And in fact, I have already found my first textual message uh, in Siena. It's very, very, I will show it to you if you like. I have taken a photograph, but it's not in my presentation, but I can show it to you um, on my mobile phone. After that. <laughs> so that was it. Thank you for for listening. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If there are maybe perhaps any questions either for our viewers here in person or our online viewers, we can take a few minutes in case there were any questions or comments from our viewers. Let's have an image of work rather than myself. It's so interesting connecting with your also to some of the work that our students are currently pursuing. Um, during their semester studies at the Siena Art Institute, looking at textures in particular of the cityscape, as well as this aspect of visual arts and language, because uh, all of our students here are coming from different areas, but are also studying Italian language during their time here. So it seems that for some texts, you're using the original language and some you're you're translating into Greek. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. For, I mean, uh, the original language or you, you know maybe a translation from English or from Italian or whatever I use the translation I have I use the book as it is as, as I as I find it I don't translate it to Greek or to another language and um, yeah and actually I've, I've, I have experimented with a language I'm not at all familiar with in a series called Babel which I haven't shown here like writing in um, Hebrew and Arabic, it was so difficult. I couldn't make straight lines, and this was very frustrating. Frustrating for me. <laughs> yeah. In terms of your linguistic background, obviously you speak English very well. Are there other uh, languages that you speak as well? Well, I would like to say that I could speak Italian if I studied a bit more, but uh, yeah, <laughs> not really. <laughs> Yeah. Um, there's um, some questions that are coming from our online viewers. Uh, for example, um, Vicky has um, said she really enjoyed the presentation and she'd like to hear about your body-mind experience during such slow processes such as these. Do you usually plan your movements on paper or do you let your hands take you? 
No, my hand begs me. But, um, it is not what I do is because I I, I don't like make, making choices. I try to to uh, follow a certain uh, uh, way of working. So um, makes um, invent the ru the rules. Like uh, for instance. Um, with uh, the bookcase uh, uh, works. And so I, I use the same um, type of paper for every work because th this makes sense to, to compare to one another. The same type of carbon paper. And of course, you know, it is my, my handwriting. It doesn't change a lot, but it is interesting because, you know, they, there are actual, well, if we, if I am to talk about uh, the bookcase series, the, there are books which I have read. so. I move faster, I copy faster, or there are books that I'm less or more interested in, um, which I think may have some impact on, on, the, on the work. Although I have to say that um, I have realized that if I write in an unknown language to me, my, I, I press the, the pen a lot harder, so the, the outcome is a lot blue, you know, darker blue than, than it should be. So maybe I don't know if I answered the question. But it is a very sensitive question. No, it is Even visually, it's very, it's very hypnotic to look at all of this. So the blue, the blue ones, you mean all? Even the other ones. Mm. Now, I had um, not so much a question, but a common fascinating to look at all the different works, thinking, um, well, maybe think about Braille, some of them. Yes, things. of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, we had um, just a couple of months ago, we hosted a program, an art program for partially sighted blind mm -hmm. people. And they, they were doing a lot of work with uh, raised mm -hmm. um, elements on, on surfaces. And that was very interesting. It also made me think about a um, piece of work that one of our artists, who's not here tonight, you have met, you know, um, oh, is um, about sign language. Because, you know, we work a lot with deaf people. So she worked with an interpreter. Um, Dipping her hands in ink and then signing mm -hmm. the surface. Just so, not a question. But yeah, but different languages and different. Um, different codes of yeah, meaning yeah, to yeah. To identify markings. Uh, yes, yeah, so, uh, what, what you said about the uh, braille, I, I did make a work. Oh, it was like 20 years ago uh, where, I, where I used the phrase uh, in Braille. Of course, I couldn't decipher it. Uh, I, couldn't, I didn't know what it was because I don't, I don't know uh, Braille. Uh, but what I did is I, I enlarged it and I traced it on, on paper, on transparent paper. So it was only the... Oh, the shadow uh, cast by the relief uh, um, um, marks of Bray. Mm -hmm. uh, and what was interesting was that, you know, at the end, uh, I, I tried to find out which word I had used, and uh, it turned out that the word was the word um, creation, but there was one in Greek, vimiurgia, uh, but there was one um, letter missing because you know I didn't know where to stop. You know, just okay, this this looks good. So you know, my approach was totally visual, and um, the outcome could not be read either by uh, blind people because it couldn't, it, it wasn't um, something they could touch, or by you know uh, by people who could uh, who could see. And it wasn't the actual, you know, it wasn't the full word even, or the full. Uh, uh, word. It was just uh, not part of it, but there was a tiny part missing, and I thought it was very ironic. But at the same time, it fitted the work so well because it, it, it is creation. But there's always something there that is not. It's, it's not included. So yeah. Um, there's a question here. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment. Um, 
Oh, right. So you're familiar with that. <laughs> Good. And I don't know, maybe in the next week, maybe it would be interesting for you to come. Of course. I would love to. Yes. And see what happens in a similar business. I would love to. Yes. <laughs> And uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I would love to. Would there any, um, any final comments? Sarah. 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 You know, it is um, uh, automatic because you, when you have, you know, this uh, A4 page, you tend to write it normally, but if, you, if you, your canvas or the A4 is, uh, you know, a lot big, it was like two, two meters by a meter and a half, something. So, yeah, it tended to be a bit uh, larger. You're right about that. Yeah. But it wasn't measured. Uh, it was you know, automatic. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, Tanya. We were discussing today right, how important it was to uh, conceptualize your work and talk about it in, uh, as an uh, explanatory thing next to your works. How important is this for young artists to know? Uh, now, apart from the art, they should be also conceptualized. Uh, to have a concept and to explain it whenever you have to have a chance because otherwise, like we were saying, it's hard to uh, see this online, for example. Mm -hmm. you see it online, it's hard because you are not meant to conceptualize it. So, now that you explain it, it's much less, it becomes much more interesting than just to see the book. Yeah. And how important is it? Well, ideally. <laughs> Ideally, the, 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 the work would be, I would like the work to be visually, not attractive, but interesting, so as to make somebody want to follow the concept behind it. Uh, the problem with my, with this type of work, my work at least, is that it doesn't print well, it doesn't um, look good on, um, I don't know, on the internet. It is, it is hard to, you know, to, to to really see the detail or and this is when you need the explanation or the concept conceptual ap approach to it more but uh it would be ideal for me if the work you know itself would um, of course uh, I do, uh not speak for it speak for itself yeah have something that would attract the viewer to learn more about it not be entirely open though because this is not my approach it is as, as you probably realize, it's um, it's about revealing and hiding, revealing and hiding at the same time, again and again and again. It's like you know wanting to say something and at the same time wanting wanting to take it back. So um, to, to go back to your question, it is important. It's very important to have some you know to have something uh, accompanying uh, the image. Uh, sometimes, especially when it is online. Um, for, 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 for this, uh, I, I, not as a help, but, but as a hint to what the work is about, I have the title. So if, if you can see, the titles of the works are mostly either the titles of books or the names of authors or names of uh, the titles of their books without the, the name of the author, things like that. So I try to, to, you know, to not create a mystery, it's not in, intentional, but I don't want it to be entirely open. I want some, you know, I want this, um, uh, this mystery, this code to unfold and uh, slowly, I guess. 
Great. Well, we probably <clears throat> should wrap up just in the interest of time, but oh, we can okay. certainly continue the conversation with our in-person audience over some refreshments as well. Uh, but we'd also like to thank our online viewers for joining us. And thank you. We've got a lot of good, positive comments that have come in as well. So uh, I'll just remind our audience that uh, we'll have some more uh, events coming up as the semester continues. We also have our second resident artist who's with us for this period, Tanya Saleh. So it's uh, real pleasure to have her as part of our community as well. Um, so we're really looking forward to having both of them with us here for the next four weeks at the Siena Art Institute. But thank you again so much to Nina Papa Constantino. I apologize for my pronunciation. And it's really been wonderful to have this insight into your creative practice. Thank you. So thank you. <laughs>